Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. For today's prelude, I'm going to play Mark Hayes's arrangement of the well-known American spiritual, Give Me Jesus. Wherever you are and whenever you are joining us, we thank you for joining us for the worship service for Bethany Presbyterian Church for February 7th, 2021. Before we begin, just a few announcements I would like to share with you all. First, today is a communion Sunday, so if you don't have your elements ready, you might want to pause the service right now and get your elements ready, or you can get them ready later on, but today we will be celebrating communion. Number two, the youth are still selling pies as a fundraiser connected with a 30-hour famine. So if you have not ordered a pie, please call the church office, talk to Trevor, and order your pie. That would be great. And then our final announcement is that next Sunday, the 14th, there will be a called congregational meeting to hear and act on the report of the pastor nominating committee. So make sure that you put that down on your calendar. We will send out a Zoom link for that. There will also be some limited in-person seating for those people who do not have a good internet connection or don't have the internet at all. We'll actually be playing the service in the sanctuary at 10 a.m. and then go right into the called congregational meeting at 11 a.m. So those are your announcements for today. And hear now the, the word of the Lord from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. The scriptures tell us this, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Will you join with me in prayer? Almighty God, we come before you today to worship you because we want your will and the word of the Lord to be revealed to us. God, I pray that that will happen for us today through the songs that we hear, through the word that we hear preached, through the scriptures that are read, God, open our eyes, reveal to us a new and wonderful glimpse of who you are. I pray this in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Will you join with me in prayer? Almighty God, in the midst of this world, sometimes we lose track of the eternal because we are focused on the immediate and the struggle that we have immediately in this world, the pandemic, who is sick, who's getting their shot, who's not getting their shot. And Lord, it's so easy for us to become so focused on what is directly in front of us that we lose sight of your eternal plan, that we lose sight that everything that is happening is really being held in the very palm of your hand. We may not understand how or why you are moving at this time, but we trust that you are. But Lord God, we do admit that we doubt and that we fear. And Lord, there are other times that we lose faith and that we sin. So here now, God, in this time of silence that is to follow, our personal and our silent prayers of confession. And Lord, I thank you that even when we doubt, you understand. When we sin and lose faith, there is grace. And Lord, I pray that as we walk through our lives every day, when we're doing the simple tasks, when we're doing our laundry, when we're cooking dinner, when we're cleaning the house, when we go to work, God, I pray very much that we would feel your presence. Lord, that we would be so connected to you as well that we would see you acting in this world and that would give us joy and hope and a peace that you are with us in all things and at all times. Lord, may we trust in that and may we live in that truth. I pray all this in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. 
We continue our sermon series in looking at obscure Bible characters in Scripture, those that, that we uh, don't spend too much time on usually, but uh, have an important message for us nonetheless. And th this week, we are going to be spending almost all of our time, all of our time, in Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 10 through 18. We're going to be uh, touching a little bit on the 9, 1 through 18, but most of that time is going to be in 10 through 18. So you can follow along on your screen or, or grab your Bible or however you read your uh, Bible uh, on your phone, tablet, whatever. Uh, go ahead and grab that as we uh, begin. But Lord, uh, let us pray before we begin. Lord, we are so grateful for your word. We're so grateful that, that you are the way and the truth and the life. What we find in Scripture is true. It is accurate. It, it guides and instructs. Through your Holy Spirit, you teach us. Lord, thank you for that privilege and that gift that it is to read your Scriptures, Lord, and to listen to the message you have through your Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives. I say this in your name. Amen. Well, I don't know, this might be a controversial opinion, but I, I believe I have grown to love the markers of the season more than the season itself. And maybe some of you are in that camp with me. I mean, how great does it feel? You remember that first day when it's fall and you know it's fall? You don't need to look at a calendar. You don't need to to check to see when it officially starts, you know. You walk outside that front door, and the air is as crisp as biting into a fresh apple, and it's just, oh, it's so good. Or, or, or maybe on the other end of it, when you know it's spring, when you walk outside and you, you feel the heat from the sun that's giving you a little taste of what summer's going to be like. But just as you're embracing that, you feel a cold breeze reminding you that winter is not too far behind. There's something about those moments in which you, you feel the season changing that are almost better than the entire season itself. And for us, in this current circumstance, I think all of us are looking for this season to change, aren't we? It has been a long year in which we have dealt with 
with all sorts of news and, and, and shutdowns and, and isolation and being apart from each other and being, doing church like this. It, is, it has been such a long season. I can remember at early on in this season, maybe you remember this too, it, there was a lot of conversation about how long this would go. I, I remember uh, hearing a conversation early on about the pandemic and, and everything being shut down, and, and somebody posed the question, well, is this more like a blizzard, or is it, is it a winter, or is it more of like an ice age? And there were some people that speculated that it's, it's going to be like an ice age. It's going to go on for a long time. But that didn't stop me, and that didn't stop a lot of people I talked to from, from early on in March and April of last year, kind of keeping the conversation going of, of when this is over. When this is over, I cannot wait to go to the Mariners game, probably in the fall. When this is over, I can't wait to have everybody over and have a big dinner, a big party, a big celebration that this is, that this is finally done with in a, in a couple months. When this is over, I'm going to go to every restaurant, every festival, every concert, every, everything I possibly can when this is over. We don't really talk like that as much anymore, do we? I think for so many of us, we, we really feel the gravity of we don't know when this is over. We see some signs of hope that maybe the seasons are beginning to change. Uh, the increase in vaccines and the, the, the lower numbers of cases. And, and we see things that are promising signs, but none of us know when the season is going to be over. But as we look ahead and as we hold on to that hope that, that the, whatever is quote-unquote normal will return, that we can, that there's a, in Scripture, in our, in our passage today, we see a change in the seasons. And we see what happens in light of the most, of the biggest change in human history season, the resurrection. The resurrection marking the most uh, impactful moment in human history. And in our passage today, we see the turning of the leaves. We see the cold breeze coming in. We see the season beginning to change. And how Ananias specifically responds to that. So we'll begin in Acts chapter 9, verses 10 uh, through 18, beginning in verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, I'm sure many of you, maybe some of you know the story, and maybe some of you don't, and you're sitting there going, it sounds like we're in the middle of something here. It's because we are. Right? Early on in chapter 9, Saul, who is this uh, very uh, righteous Pharisee, he is a man who is, is passionately in pursuit of what he considers the blasphemers, the people who follow Jesus. Right? He sees this, this community of people growing that have actively turned their faith from what he considers the one true God to a man, the son of a carpenter. And he can't stand this heresy, this blasphemy, and, and he is using the Jewish law to, to charge and, and even execute these followers of Jesus. And so that is exactly what he's seeking to do on his way to Damascus. He, he sent out these letters to all the synagogues in Damascus, telling them, hey, prepare, get ready. I am coming, me and my buddies, we're going to come, and we're going to round up as many Christians as we can, and we're going to charge them and, and, and even lead them to execution if, if, the charges are, if the charges stick. And so as he is on his way to Damascus, now here's the more familiar story that many of us might know, especially if we've read Acts, because it's in there a lot. But Saul has this confrontation with Jesus. This heavenly light shines all around them, and, and Saul is blinded in his eyes, and he, 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 is, he is confronted with the reality that Jesus truly is Lord. 
and it is still on it, and he continues his path on Damascus, but completely a changed man. He's no longer in pursuit of the Christians like he was beforehand. He's, he's now in this position in which he's weak and vulnerable and exposed, and he is helped along to Damascus. And that is where we pick up, in which God goes to Ananias, a disciple, a follower of Jesus who lives in Damascus. And he gives him this instruction, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Don't you love that God adds kind of a descriptor? Uh, there's a man from Tarsus named Saul. He, he's here in Damascus. He, you must think like Ananias must be like, I, you don't, I know. <laughs> I know who Saul is. I know why he's here. Uh, and I know what he's seeking to do. And in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm not really going out like I usually were, usually was to, uh, to avoid, well, him. But he says, go and, and see the, seek this man from Tarsus named Saul. Now, this is interesting in how he begins his orders to Ananias. The very beginning, you, we've, we've said this a couple times, at the very beginning he says, go. In the Greek, we're not going to get overwhelmingly in the Greek here, but in the Greek, that's an imperative. It's a charge. It's, it's God's command to Ananias. He not only has to go, but then it says, and ask for a man from Tarsus. He that word for ask in the Greek is uh, more broadly seek. So here what, 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 what God is telling Ananias to do is to actively pursue Saul. God didn't tell Ananias to uh, go to Straight Street, go to the big uh, town, the big city, you know, the main drag of town, and, and just hang out for a bit. Hit the farmer's market relax. And, and Oh, and by the way, if, if you run into Saul, if you might see him, uh, go ahead and just lay your hands on him and heal him. Um, and then, well, I'll tell you what to do from there. No, no, no. Ananias is instructed to go down the main drag of Damascus and actively seek out Saul. You can imagine how this is playing out in Ananias's mind. Him going down the street, act, actively grabbing people on the shoulder. Hey, can you tell me where Judas's house is? Can you tell me where I might find Saul? I need to see him. How many people might look at him and say, you follow Jesus. He is here to kill people like you. This is absurd. Why in the world would, would Ananias go actively pursue Saul? unless something's different. But Ananias doesn't know that, and he, he makes that very well known in the next couple of verses here. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people and Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. I love this response from Ananias. It's, it's almost as if he's like, ah, oh, you didn't get the news. I get it. I understand. Let me, let me fill you in a little bit. Uh, he has arrested and killed a lot of followers of you. And one minor detail to add, he's also here to kill me too. So do you want to change that, that instruction or that command? But the important point is that based on the information that Ananias has, I mean, he's right. To, to go pursue Saul, to, to go and, and seek him out, is a failed mission from the get-go. Because we see back in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Isn't that an interesting way to put it? It doesn't say speaking threats or proclaiming threats. He was breathing out threats. That it was, it was embedded in the core of his being, that, that he had this murderous spirit within him. It was, you, you can imagine, it's just he, Saul was a blazing furnace of wrath and, and anger towards Christians, towards followers of Jesus. That Saul could never be approached like Ananias is instructed to do here. 
I mean, how many times and for how long did prayers for a changed heart for that man go unanswered? How long did, did interactions with Saul feel like winter? How many times did a mother's son not make it home because he was caught up by Saul's men outside a synagogue and the mother actively prayed for a changed heart only to go unanswered, never to see her son again? How many times did, did a, a, a follower of Jesus stand ready to be executed, looking at that man, staring at him with anger and rage, and actively pray in a, in a last moment for a changed heart for that man, only to be met with his execution? For how long was it like this? That Saul was just fixed. You don't go to that man. You don't go near that man. You hide when he comes to town. You avoid him at all costs. Based on the information that Ananias has, he's right. This is a failed mission. This is a failed instruction. God, this is never going to work. I know who this man is. But Ananias doesn't know that massive life-altering event that happened between uh, where he was to where he is now in Damascus, on that road to Damascus. And Ananias doesn't know the, 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 the reality that Saul has come to faith in Jesus as Lord. He doesn't have that information available to him. And you would think that that would be a good help to Ananias in, in, what, in how God responds. But God answers a different way in verse 15. Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So first, God reiterates his initial command, his initial instruction. Go. I told you go before, and I'm going to tell you go now. And I heard your protest, but the the command is the same. The instruction is the same. What you are to do doesn't change. Go. But then he had something fascinating. He says, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles. There's a lot to unpack here. But first, Saul is, his, is God's chosen instrument? Wait, if, if Jesus is truly Lord, If he is who he says he is, and and here is this man who has actively been been imprisoning and and executing followers of Jesus just simply because they believed he was who he said he was. If Jesus really is Lord, then then wouldn't that make Saul in the the most uh, opposite place of chosen instrument? Wouldn't he be severely excluded? Wouldn't he be completely isolated from the people of God? Wouldn't the wrath and the rage and the judgment of God fall down on Saul and, and, and smash him to smithereens? Like, like, wouldn't that be the result of Saul's actions? But instead, he's your chosen instrument? And he's your chosen instrument to the Gentiles. The same Gentiles that in chapter 10, Peter himself calls impure and, and should not be associated with, with fellow Jews. Now, Peter, in chapter 10, he's, he's reversing his prior views, but that was the view that was held. Even by Peter, even by the disciples, at, at one point, the, the idea was that the Gentiles were not included in, quote-unquote, this people of God. But again, if the resurrection is the marker of a new season, then we are seeing a, the radical effects that have, that have been caused because of it. No longer is this Abraham's family faith or the 12 tribes' faith or, or Israel's faith. This faith has, has exploded to the ends of the earth. And for the first time, these followers of Jesus, it's almost as if they're seeing new colors for the first time or, or hearing new notes of music they've never heard before. They are seeing the, the kingdom of God expanding in ways that is completely obliterating the categories they had for it. The kingdom of God is, is, is far greater, far, far more expansive than they had in place for that. 
to include and to welcome in this uh, this murderer along with with the Gentiles, and as we see in chapter 8, along with the eunuch, who, who in Deuteronomy 23, as you, you'll see that the eunuchs were completely excluded from the people, presence in the people of God. So, so here you have all of a sudden 8 through 10, especially focused in on not, chapter 9, this radical invitation to all people at the all ends of the earth to enter into a relationship with God. And Ananias is at standing at the center of it, and he's instructed to welcome in, probably one of the hardest ones to welcome in. What a radical moment that follows the resurrection. And we see how that unfolds in verse 17. And then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. How awkward. I mean, I, I can't get it past this image of Ananias walking through the front door so gingerly, seeing all of Saul's men immediately turn their attention towards him, knowing what he believes, knowing who he is. And Ananias slowly walking through the house and, and, and making this, this quick eye contact with each man as they, as they look at him in, in somewhat of a different light. And then he sees Saul. This vulnerable, exposed, weakened man that Ananias is so feared for so long, especially in the last coming days. And you can imagine as Saul is sitting there praying and, and, and so vulnerable in this moment and the emotions that are going through his head. And Ananias bound, bends down and puts his hands on him and immediately calls him brother brother. He, he immediately welcomes him in with familiar, t fam familial terms, if that's a word, I think it is, <laughs> with familial terms, calling him brother, welcoming him in to the family, the people of God. He's done nothing to earn it. He's done absolutely the opposite to earn it. He's done nothing to deserve it. And, and, and Saul, who later changes names, changes his name to Paul, is, is fully aware of this as he calls himself the worst of sinners. And yet Ananias welcomes him in in this radical reframing of who actually belongs in a relationship with God. That no matter the past, no matter the history, no matter the wealth, no matter the education, no matter the income, no matter the status, no matter what has been done, can, can restrict, can exclude somebody from the people of God, can exclude somebody from a relationship with God. What good news is to that, us who are so often so sinful, so broken, so flawed and stumbling so much. You'd think at some point God would just be fed up with us, but God brings us in closer, just like he does to Saul. What good news is that to us today? But it's also a reminder that even though as, as Ananias wasn't, wasn't seeing Jesus in, in, in physical form, he wasn't, he wasn't seeing the miracles, he wasn't seeing the teachings, he, he was still witnessing the effects of the kingdom of God being rolled out, being expanded into the world. That after the season change, after the resurrection, he, he was beginning to see the leaves turn. He was beginning to feel the breeze and beginning to see how God is moving. And I don't know what it's going to look like when this season changes. Don't know when it's going to happen. Don't know how it's going to happen or what will happen with it. But we know that at some point, 
this shut down kind of life is not going to continue. Thankfully, we know at some point we will, we will at least be able to return to some sort of normalcy. But the question for us is the similar question that Ananias had to wrestle with. What is God inviting us into as the season begins to change? What was, what was not nearly possible yesterday, last month, last year? What was something that we would just consider that that would just be the farthest from the realm of possibility? That person will never come to know Christ. That person is so in the dark when it comes to Jesus. What, who is that person that things might change on the other side of this? Maybe for some of us, we, we, before this whole pandemic, before this whole shutdown began, we felt like our family was on shaky ground, but now we're, come, we're, we're, we're looking to get out of it, and our family is as strong as iron because we've just spent so much time together. And now we feel like we have a confidence and a firm footing to extend hospitality to neighbors, to coworkers, to people on those outer circles because we feel like we really, truly have, maybe for the first time, ever a strong core. Maybe for some of us, there, there was some fear, some anxiety, some, some paralysis in our mind that, that didn't allow us to pursue something that we felt like God was inviting us into. But over the last year, over the shutdown, over whatever has happened, you have all of a sudden felt a more confidence, um, uh, an embracing, uh, 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 a uh, boldness to pursue that that you once considered completely off limits. Who is that person? What is that thing? Who, what is God instructing and saying? Go and seek and watch as my kingdom continues to unfold in your context. And may we find the boldness to pursue it. May we start dreaming up with excitement as, as things begin to lighten up. Maybe, maybe we begin to start making plans of, of how when, this, when we move into the next season after this one, here are some things we're going to do. Here is how God is calling our family, our, our relationship, our, our, our priorities, our income, our bank account. Here is how God is calling us to utilize the things that we have into, these, into this next season. May we embrace it and may we pursue it and see the new colors, the new sounds that we never thought were possible. Let us join together in prayer. Mm, Lord, how you love us. How patient you are with us. How often you, how we look back on our past and you may have called us like you called Ananias and maybe at those times we said, no, no thanks. But yet you call us again. Lord, may we open our ears to the word, to the instruction you're giving us. May we open our eyes to the, to the things that you see. Open our hearts to move in directions that we never thought were possible. And may we watch and witness as you, Holy Spirit, are moving and radically changing our community unlike anything we could have ever imagined. Love in your name. We have the privilege today to celebrate the sacrament of communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. It goes by many names. And when I was growing up in the church, at this time in the worship service, it was always kind of a somber time. And I understand that. We want to be respectful of the fact that Jesus has died. But what this table represents is not only that Jesus died, but that he was raised to new life for himself and for us, and that is the truth that we celebrate at this table. And so that is a truth that is we celebrate in love. This table is not necessarily to be dreaded, but it is to be celebrated because of what it represents, God's amazing love for us. And so we come with joyful hearts, with hearts that reflect hopefully God's love for us.
and on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he was at table with his disciples. And after having given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for you and for me, the people of God. At Bethany Presbyterian Church, we have a tradition of partaking of the bread together, signifying our unity as a body of Christ, and then we partake of the cup individually, representing our individual relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to go serve Trevor, who's in the sanctuary with me, and then I'll come back, and then we will take the bread together, and then I will go serve in the cup, and we will partake of the cup individually. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now, please feel free to take the cup individually, if you want to Pause it at this moment just to give yourself some time of quiet reflection and prayer. You're, you're welcome to do that. And then turn us back on again. But we'll be taking the cup individually. Will you join with me in prayer? Almighty God, I thank you so much for what this table represents, your great love for us. The fact that death could not hold you down, sin could not hold you down or defeat you. But Lord, love has overcome. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you died for us. I thank you that you were raised to new life for us. Not only for us, but also for people in this world who has yet to hear the gospel, who have yet to understand your love for them. So God, may we not only take this love and what this table represents for ourselves, but help us then to communicate that love that you have for us and for all people into the community and in the world. I pray this in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen.